Yeah, looks awesome. Okay, so Good. um my name is Tyler. I am an artist and a budding biologist currently studying at the University of Milwaukee. And today I'm going to talk about mycology, the fungus among us. Um, just as an overview, um, I'm going to define and describe what mycology is, and I'm going to talk about our knowledge of our current human relationship with kingdom fungi, as well as fungi's ecological importance. And I'm also going to give a brief history of modern mycology, um, as well as Earth's fungal evolution. And then I'll talk about um, many reasons why I think mycology is just so dang cool um, and where our current mycological research is going to take us for future scientific advancements. And then I'll share the project that I've been working on um, with observations from this summer's uh, macrofungi of, of Riverside Park, as well as uh, the iNaturalist project <clears throat> that I created for future Urban Ecology Center observations. So to start off, um, mycology, just as a quick definition, um, is just the branch of biology concerned with the study of fungi. And fungi can be defined as a group of any unicellular or multicellular spore-producing organisms that feed on organic matter. <clears throat> and I don't know, I guess just speaking on behalf of fungi, I would say that it is one of the most overlooked and misrepresented organisms in the web of life. Um, it's estimated that there are at least 5 million species of fungi on Earth, but we've only discovered about 1% of them. I guess I'm the type of person um, that's always rooting for the underdog. So I'm super excited to share all the fascinating things that I've learned while exploring this topic. Okay. Um, so there are many phylums of fungi, but today I'm going to talk about just some three common examples. And the first one is um, Asomycota, which uh, includes penicillium, which is the group of fungi that is used in penicillin. Um, it's also found in various cheeses like blue cheese, camembert, and brie, which I think are delicious, but to each their own. Um, but it was only about 100 years ago that Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillium, penicillin. And, um, this was used to combat bacterial epidemics that kept sweeping the planet. And like since then, I think our world's population has tripled. Um, this also uh, includes Saccharomyces, which is the yeast that is used for baking bread. <clears throat> the next one that we'll talk about is Basidiomycota. And I think when you think of fungi, you probably think of mushrooms and that belongs to this phylum. And um, this is the agaricus mushroom. It's just your common edible mushroom. It's um, the brown mushroom, but the white mushrooms, brown mushrooms, and portobellas all are the same <laughs> mushroom, just at different life stages. Um, and I think if you were to close your eyes and try to envision a mushroom, you probably would think of this mushroom, which is an amanita. Um, <clears throat> it's super popular in pop culture and video games and things. Um, and this is a common poisonous mushroom. Um, Basidiomycota also includes plant rust diseases that you'll find on leaves of plants and trees. And it also includes psilocybe cubensis, which is the mushroom that causes hallucinogenic effects um, that has a super interesting history um, in human civilization. But it is now once again being used as a guided medicine for trauma and stress disorders, as well as depression therapy. And um, the last one that I'll talk about is glomeromycota, which is a personal favorite of mine, just because um, this phylum forms symbiotic relationships with their plant hosts. And it's also known as arbuscular mycorrhizae. And <clears throat> it's almost like a information superhighway for plants and trees and ecosystems sort of like a secondary root system that lives underground. Um, a lot more research needs to be done about these 
these networks to fully understand their importance with biodiversity. But as of right now, there are 400 known species that cannot photosynthesize without their mycorrhizal network. And this diagram here is um, research done in Canada with a group of trees. And I found this really great um, video that explains it really well. Underneath the soil, a vast and interconnected network of life links the trees through their root systems. But they can't talk to each other without help. The whole process starts with hub trees, the oldest and tallest trees in the forest. Hub trees have greater access to sunlight and through the process of photosynthesis, end up producing more sugar than they actually need. Underground, fungi need sugar to survive. Most of their bodies are made up of a mass of threads called mycelium. They grow within the root system of trees to absorb the excess sugar. In return, the mycelium provides the tree with the nutrients it needs from the soil. This symbiotic relationship is known as mycorrhiza, which stems from the Greek words for fungus and root. These tree-fungi relationships connect the trees in the forest together, forming an underground communication network to exchange water and nutrients, to nurture their seedlings, and even send warning signals when under threat. So, how many trees are really talking to each other? To get a better picture of these forest relationships, a team of researchers used DNA analysis to map a fungal network in a patch of Canadian forest. Remarkably, they found that one tree was connected to 47 other trees. Their models also showed that when hub trees were removed, it would cause more connections to be lost than if trees were simply removed randomly. Studying these kinds of underground exchanges will play a vital role in creating stronger, more resilient forests for the future. So even though we might not be able to talk to trees, at least we can still keep trying to understand their language. Who knows what they might say? I love that video. Um, that's from National Geographic. Um, so some of you might say, wait a minute, fungi aren't plants. And um, this might come to a surprise to some of us that fungi are actually a part of their own kingdom and not related to plants. And that's because it just wasn't recognized until a few decades ago. I mean, I remember when I was in grade school, plants were still our fungi was still grouped together as plants and taught that way. I also really remember a lot of classes that I took. Mycology was only really a, like one day of the unit um, of plants. So um, this, is a, this is a new, relatively new science, although we've been learning about it for a long time. Um, and as it turns out, uh, animals and fungi share a common ancestor and branched away from plants at some point about 1.5 billion years ago. So it was only later that animals and fungi separated on the genealogical tree of life. So that means that mushrooms are actually more closely related to humans than they are to plants. <clears throat> so I wanted to briefly talk about modern mycology as we know it. Um, this is just the modern uh, area in biology. Um, but that being said, mycology has been, and mushrooms have ha held a very important place in history of humans for a very long time. But these are just the early scientists from around the 1700s and early 1800s. And um, Ilias Magnus Fries was a Swedish mycologist and botanist, and he was known for his work in modern taxonomy of mushrooms. And he utilized and solidified the vocabulary that we still use today to describe specimens. And next we have Christian Hedrick Persoon, a German mycologist born in South Africa, 
who published um, some of the early illustrations of fungi in three parts in 1790, 1791, and 1793. <clears throat> and we also have this fine gentleman that kind of gives me some Nicholas Cage vibes <laughs> in this photo, but his name is Anton de Berry, and he was a German surgeon, botanist, microbiologist, and mycologist, and considered a founding father of plant pathology as well as um, a founding father of modern mycology. We also have Elizabeth Eaton Morse, who was an American mycologist from the early 1900s, who was born in Massachusetts. Um, as you can imagine, in this time period, her work wasn't taken very seriously, and there's actually very little public information about her body of work. But um, from what I was able to find, she was primarily interested in macroscopic fungi, and she organized California's Mycological Society as a means to promote the collection of mycological specimens. Um, this is the only photo I could really find of her, and it was taken in about 1930. I would love to know what kind of specimen she's holding. Um, so you may also know the name Beatrix Potter. She was the author of The Tale of Peter Rabbit, but she was also um, a significant um, mycologist, she made major contributions in the field in the early 1900s and late 1800s. And um, she's also an American mycologist that was born in Massachusetts. And here's another picture of her that I absolutely adore. Um, this is her with her pet mouse, which is just so cute. Um, and in 1867, she proved that lichen wasn't actually a single organism, but um, was a symbio symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae. Um, and she did this by germinating a lichen and noticing that it only produced a specific fungus. Um, because she was a woman, she wasn't allowed to present her research to the Botanical Society. Uh, her uncle actually had to do it for her. And the men of the Botanical Society dismissed her findings and told her that what she thought was lichen was just a lichen-like fungus, which has since been debunked. Um, but unfortunately, she was laughed out of science. And I don't know, I think that this is really interesting. There's a lot of more recent papers. Um, one that I can think of is uh, Queer Theory of Lichens. <laughs> uh, I think it was written in 2015 and it talks about how mutualism and symbiotic relationships have just continually been just written off as being sentimental. And this is really just by scientists that value um, competition rather than cooperation in their fields. So I very much commend Beatrix Potter um, for doing this important work, despite the way that she was treated in that time period. I, uh, I also want to talk about some ethnomycology really briefly. I just have a few things to say about it that I think are really cool. Um, and ethnomycology is the study of how people have used fungi as food, tinder, medicine, and spiritual tools. Um, historically, there were sacred objects in North America. And on the left here, we have Leploporus odorus. And um, this is found in Canada and in Northwestern Europe. And this mushroom was used like sage and sweet grass, um, sort of like as a purification in rituals because it has like a licorice anise flavor <laughs> of odor. <laughs> and um, this has been an important fungus in traditional Native American cultures of the Northern Plains. Um, the Blackfoot, Blood, Cree, and other Northern Plains tribes use this mushroom. Um, it was a spiritual symbol that was used as a decoration um, for sacred objects. And it was also used as a healing tool. Um, it was used to stop wounds from bleeding and made into infusions to treat stomach issues and diarrhea. And it was also combined with other fungi to treat coughs and infections. And then on the right, we have Phileus ignarius, which uh, usually grows on birch trees. Um, and it has been recorded since the 19th century for Native American uses. Coastin, coastal Alaskan people traded with Yukon Indians to obtain it and um, the Yupik and Dina peoples of the far Northwest uh, would keep ashes of this in just gorgeous, I wish I had a picture, but just gorgeous box, boxes that were decorated with um, ivory made of wood and bone. And um, before tobacco was introduced by the Europeans, 
that you pick mixed the burnt fungus um, ashes with other plants and materials like cottonwood bark and smoked it or made a quid out of it. And it was later mixed with tobacco. And today the ash tobacco mixture is still sold in native Alaskan communities by the name Ikmik. And um, Tom Volk, who is our resident Wisconsin mycologist at the University of La Crosse, wrote a great essay with Diane Plunninger um, about ICMIC, and it talks about the dangerous impacts of the use of these two substances actually used together because apparently there's an alkaline chemical in the fungus that actually enhances the absorption of nicotine. Um, it's a really great essay. The last one that I'll talk about is Homeotopsis officinalis, and this uh, this fungi grows in kind of a really radical, cool column shape, and it can reach up to one meter in height, um, which is huge. <laughs> and um, this fungus was used to treat many ailments, but its significant and very interesting use um, was to be carved and placed on graves of shamans to guard them. And after a shaman's death, the carved Car fungus figures were placed at the head of the grave in order to send a message that the grave was occupied by spirits. I think that these carvings are just so cool. Um, and I, yeah, there's still so much to learn about the uses of fungi by um, our Northern American indigenous peoples, but it's clear that fungi is perceived to be powerful and a mystical object even. Um, and it played an important role in the history um, of our culture. So a world without fungi, um, when I try to think about it, I immediately get bummed out because that would mean a world without pizza or bread um, or cheese or soy sauce um, or even salami or miso. Um, fungi also help make fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi and um, we wouldn't be able to drink beer or wine or kombucha. Um, so I'm kind of hungry now, but um, <laughs> um, fossilized fungal filaments are seen here on the left. And um, we generally understand fungi's role to be the ability to decompose major plant components, particularly lignin and cellulose. Um, they're the role of the recycler, nature's recyclers. But if uh, we try to picture what life on earth would be without a decomposer fungi around, we might imagine a world where we would just soon be buried in organic um, matter and litter and debris. But what if I told you that fungi are actually responsible for life on land as we know it? Um, on the left here is um, a, a illustration of some liverworts, which is a division of non-vascular land plants and Earth's earliest land plants. And fungi were some of the first complex life forms on land. Um, and they helped these land plants move away from these tiny marginal little things that dwelled on the water's edge and into large forests and ecosystems. Um, they, uh, fungi originally were mining rocks for mineral nourishment and which slowly turned it into the soil that we know today. Um, they also provided essential minerals for land plants that allowed them to spread and turn our, our planet green and blue. Um, so this is a very pretty picture of a Wisconsin landscape. And it might be hard to imagine life on Earth without trees, but it hasn't always been this way. Um, fungi about 400 million years ago had stalks up to three feet wide and could grow nearly 30 feet tall. Um, and back then the tallest any proto tree like organism could grow would just be a couple feet tall. And it was confirmed that these fossils um, of these massive organisms were fungi just in 20, 20, uh, 2007, <laughs> uh, which speaks to the infancy uh, really of our human understanding of the kingdom as a whole. Because um, the first research was issued in Canada in 1859. So the major indicator that they did not originate from plants was the variety of carbon types found in them that are very different from the carbon traces that are left in the plant species that dated around that same era. And um, here's a fossil um, that was studied 
But um, life in that inhabited earth at the time of these really cool uh, fungi largely consisted of really primitive vascular plants, like I mentioned in the previous slide, and uh, worms and millipedes and insects that didn't have wings. So that would make these fungal organisms what we call prototaxites, um, the largest organism on Earth during the late Silurian and Devonian periods. And today, fungi still hold the record as the largest living land organism on Earth. Um, while the blue whale is known for being the largest animal to exist on the planet, um, a mushroom species called honey fungus is said to be the largest creature on Earth. In 1992, there was a team of researchers who discovered a colony of honey fungus in Michigan um, that totally trumped uh, record holders like the aspen trees because it weighed about 10.5 tons and stretched about 37 acres. But later, that same team was looking in Oregon, in Oregon and didn't expect to um, beat that record. And it was, uh, they found something that uh, estimated weight was about 40,000 tons and spans from Oregon and into Canada. So it's about 2,384 acres, which is just massive and so cool to think about. Um, what makes the honey fungus the largest land organism is actually its underground body of mycelium. When we think of mushrooms, we're only really looking at a very small reproductive organ of the fungal body. And mycelium is the vegetative part of the fungus that consists of the network of fine filaments and white filaments that are called hyphae. And one of the primary roles of fungi in an ecosystem is to decompose organic compounds Petroleum products and some pesticides um, are also able to be absorbed by this um, by mycelium and other soil contaminants as well. And fungi have uh, the potential to eradicate these pollutants from their environments, um, unless the chemicals prove toxic to the fungus, but most fungi have proved to be super resilient to these pollutants. Um, and this brings me to my next topic, which is mycoremediation, which I think is just so cool. And um, this word comes from the Greek word that means fungus and um, the uh, suffix remedium in Latin means restoring balance. So it is a form of bioremediation in which fungi based methods are used to decontaminate the environment. And fungi have been proven to be a cheap, effective, and environmentally sound way to remove a wide array of contaminants from um, just damage, damaged soil and wastewater and air environments. Um, these contaminants include heavy metals, uh, organic pollutants, um, textile dyes, leather tanning, chemicals and wastewater, and, um, petroleum fuels, hydrocarbons, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, and herbicides, and all of these things can be found in land, freshwater, and marine environments, and in the air. And um, right here, this is a picture of Peter McCoy, um, who is the author of a very in-depth and well-put-together book called Radical Mycology. And I participated in a workshop here, you can see me when I had long hair, <laughs> uh, there we are um, planting some mushrooms in the community garden in River West on Bremen Street. Um, next to me is my dad, Sam. And um, that was a project led by Peter uh, in the River West community. And um, Peter McCoy is one of many who is currently working on ways to eliminate pollutants through micro-remediation. Micro and in the picture above me, um, is from a video that you can find on YouTube. Um, it's a snapshot from the video from a project from um, the Radical Mycology Mycoremediation Lab, um, Le Commune in Switzerland. And here he is using mycelium to eradicate motor oil from soil. And um, the last picture is from the same video here beneath Peter. And he's using mycelium to actually eat cigarettes and cigarette butts. And he was able to make living uh, ashtrays, if you will. But um, mycelium has a lot of potential in getting rid of uh, different 
pollutants and um, litter. And some fungi are useful in biodegradation um, of contaminants that exist in just really extremely cold or even radioactive environments where traditional remediation methods like bacterial um, remediation prove to be too costly or just uh, impossible due to the extreme conditions. So microremediation can even be used for fire management. They, um, there's been research done where spores are encased in a pellet and introduced to a substrate that has been in a burnt forest or even introduced before a burning. And um, it can break down the toxins in the environment and stimulate growth. Um, all of this is super interesting to me. This is something that I would really love to study, especially in an urban environment, um, to get rid of pollutants and soil contaminants. Um, so yeah, I hope this is a future project of mine. Um, the byproducts of the remediation can be valuable materials themselves. Um, edible or even medicinal mushrooms can be used. And this makes the remediation project, project just like even more valuable. Um, in this video, we will see a mushroom that has the ability to eat plastic from bags and um, the mushroom itself is actually edible, which is just mind blowing. I just think that's so amazing. Um, yeah, so cool. So using mycelium can be an excellent way to remove plastics, um, but it can also be a very useful tool to replace the use of uh, plastic packaging just entirely. So there are companies who are utilizing these packaging options already, and it is an extremely cheap a uh, product to produce because it can be grown on otherwise spent organic material from like used coffee grounds to just excess um, organic material from um, farming. And because it can be grown on otherwise spent um, organic material, it, um, it also um, is really easy to mold into these really cool forms. Um, and there are also new materials like uh, fabrics and um, large uh, fashion corporations are even using things to replace things like uh, leather that are grown from fungi. And this is all just really incredible because um, this is something that's happening now. Um, this isn't something that we're all just waiting for. It's huge to me that these strides are already really being made, especially with large, um, large brands taking on um, this and it's just incredible that this stuff can be composted after it's used. Um, going a step further, there's really interesting progress in the world of using mycelium as a building material. Here, just like in the previous slide, um, they're using molds to make brick like forms. And um, the brick molds are made and then they're filled with substrate, and the mycelium can grow on it. And um, this material has proven to be fire resistant water resistant, which makes it mold resistant, and it's extremely durable, um, like super, super strong. Ah, that's really cool. Um, replacing concrete with this sustainable material is especially interesting as concrete is the most widely used substance on earth after water and one of the main producers of carbon dioxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas, as I'm sure we know. Um, concrete is used to 
create, I mean, hard surfaces. <laughs> There's something about humans. We just really like smooth, hard, stable, flat <laughs> surfaces for some reason. But these surfaces um, contribute to runoff that cause soil erosion, water pollution, and flooding. And um, the process it's, uh, itself in creating um, concrete uh, contributes to air and water pollution as well. I mean, concrete can be recycled, but um, just the, the process in even recycling it, it, it makes me question that uh, sustainability. Um, so if you look at this uh, demonstration, you can even see that the structures, because what's happening inside that brick is there's, there's structures that are um, holding it together. So um, the bricks really have the ability to like take an impact and, um, this really could open a lot of doors in safely constructing structures and homes as we confront realities of climate change um, with the increased extreme weather and the increase of natural disasters that have been going on over the past 50 years. So super exciting stuff. All right, so we have reached um, the portion of my talk that I'm very excited about. I'm gonna walk through some of the common fungi that I found over the past summer um, in Riverside Park. Um, all of these specimens are relatively common and I'm sure you'll be able to run into them yourselves. Um, I just to give like a brief overview, like last last summer, I did some research, uh, mycological research in New York in the Catskills. And I was really fortunate to run into a wide array of just fascinating uh, macro fungi. And uh, there will be a paper that will be published soon. It's in the works. Uh, it'll be published with macro taxon of our findings in the Catskills. Um, but uh, this, I, I wanted to mention that because what we're going to be finding in Riverside Park is our more common species. And that really speaks to um, the health of our forests. And as a comparison, um, I live on the other side of the river from um, the Urban Ecology Center. And um, there is some biodiversity, fungal biodiversity, but um, there are, it's largely um, even more common and um, you don't see it as much of a variety. So I think this research would be really interesting to see how um, the, has the forest health um, in these areas increase, in these urban areas increase to see um, how the fungal diversity also would increase. So the first one that I'll talk about is uh, Xyleria polymorpha, which uh, is aptly named dead man's fingers. Um, here they are white because they're covered in a spore surface, um, but they eventually turn like grayish. And uh, I guess they kind of like resemble burnt, dried out fingers reaching out of the ground for an unwitting passerby to drag them down into the depths of the earth. Um, but don't worry, they're, uh, they're just saprobic fungi, uh, which means that they only live on decaying hardwood stumps and logs, and they're usually at the near, near the base of the stump. Um, and then the next one we have here is polyporus varius, which is the blackfoot polypore. Um, Amanda has recently started calling it wild toast, <laughs> but I think that's just because we're hungry on bird walks. Um, this is also a very widely distributed fungi across um, North America. And you can't see it in this photo, but the stem is usually off center from the cap. So it's, a, it's usually off a bit. And um, at the very base of the cap, at the foot of the, or at the base of the stem, um, it's black. So it looks like it has a little black foot where it attaches to the substrate. And they're common, but I just think they're total cuties. Um, next we have the, white cheese polypore. <laughs> and um, this mushroom has a lot of haters, uh, so to speak. It is often described in books as being ho-hum or boring. Um, but I think the interesting thing about it is it has a very fragrant odor. Um, Michael Kuo, who is the prominent amateur um, mycologist who I often turn to for identification help, um, I'll quote him. He says, 
oh sure, the world probably needs this mushrooms as it's a widespread and common decomposer of dead wood, but that doesn't mean I have to get excited about it, <laughs> which I just think is really funny. And it's just, you know, they're white um, and um, nondescript, but I think they're really cool. Um, and um, these uh, are, are found all over um, the Pacific Northwest, Maritime Provinces, uh, Great Plains, and where we're at, uh, it, it is not found in any of the southwestern United States. Um, so yeah, next we have um, dog vomit slime mold. Um, that's its common name, <laughs> but I would say if your dog's barf looks anything like that, um, it probably needs a trip to a vet. It's also sometimes called scrambled egg slime or flowers of tan because of its uh, super yellow appearance. And um, this is a common slime mold um, with worldwide distribution. And I, I tricked you <laughs> because slime molds actually belong to uh, Kingdom um, Protista. But when we uh, survey, I'm going to also be looking for them because they uh, reproduce very similarly um, with spores. And they also live on decaying plants in organic matter and microorganisms. And um, the main difference is that they have a cell wall composed of cellulose, which uh, fungi usually does not. Um, next here we have the geoglossum, um, earth tongues. I, ah, I love these mushrooms, they're just so cool. Um, they're so wild looking. Um, but you'll notice here that the Latin name is not narrowed down to species. And that's because um, the geogloss, uh, family are just an absolute nightmare to identify without a microscope. <laughs> but um, sometimes you'll see them and they'll be just a, like a brilliant black color, like a very deep, like almost blue black. Um, and these might just be young ones too. Um, but I hear if you can get your hands on a microscope, I haven't yet, um, you'll be rewarded with some super fascinating and funky microscopic features. And then all the way on the right, we have Ductifera. Oh, we're going to try it. <laughs> Pulula Juana. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love these little dudes. Uh, they are especially fun to like poke and tickle because um, <laughs> they're, they're jelly-like and they're bouncy. Um, don't pick them, but I'll personally grant permission to tickle them because it's fun. And I think that the fungi secretly like it um, <laughs> too. So something that I find interesting is that um, these are very widespread uh, in North America and even extend into South America and they fruit on decayed wood of hardwoods. Um, and they are apparently one of the later fungi species that line up to decompose dead wood when a tree falls. Sometimes I find them um, coming into a log as another fungi is sort of dying off and they're typically found on like well rotted logs that don't have um, bark anymore like the bark has decayed off of them. Next we have another slime mold red raspberry slime mold. I love this name because it's like delicious and disgusting all at the same time. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned with the with the other slime mold, um, they're complicated. Slime molds are complicated. Um, they're not quite fungi, and as of right now, um, technically in a different kingdom. But I guess I just wanted to also mention that they had been formally placed in fungi kingdom because they produce, um, like I said, the the spores. Um, but the term slime mold actually is just out of convenience to sort of group together several kinds of unrelated organisms together, uh, honestly. So. Um, a lot more research needs to be done with the slime mold family. They're very elusive creatures that don't last very long in the wild. So um, it would be really fun to study them. Um, in the middle here, we have turkey tail, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, I think they're absolutely gorgeous. They're also just everywhere. They reach every continent and are find, found um, world, worldwide. And there is a massive amount of research going into the ways that Turkey tail can help us in um, the medical world from reducing um, risks of diabetes. They have anti-tumor properties, so they've been um, used as a support during cancer treatments. And it's just such a cool and important mushroom. And I think it is even cooler that they're so common and that they've been 
utilized and found everywhere in the world for so long. Oops, <laughs> not there yet. Okay, uh, scaly ink cap. That'll be the last one um, that I'll talk about, although there are a lot more. Um, these are impressive little woodland fungi. Um, they're usually found fruiting in like really large clusters. Um, and they change color they as they age they, they go from like a whitish to a grayish color and uh there's been uh, there's been trouble in actually naming this it's, they've gone through some like taxonomic torture in the process of naming this species but uh I guess, fortunately, the mushroom doesn't really care uh, what we call it. <laughs> but the common name is scaly cap or scaly ink cap. And um, the, the cap has scales on it, um, which you can't see so well in this photo, but the gills um, when they're young are white at first and then they turn gray and then they turn kind of purplish and then they turn black. And, um, and then they turn to like a gooey, black, cool liquid um that like drips down under the cap and it's uh super cool looking i i love them um they're creepy all right so this brings me to the the iNaturalist project that i'm super pumped about um so uh i made a iNaturalist project macro fungi of the urban ecology center um and this has all three of the UEC locations um, mapped out in it. And uh, when I when I made it, I was like so excited. There was already uh, 136 observations and already there were 32 observers um, who and, ident and 47 identifiers um, who have been uh, like adding to this general area that had already been mapped out. Um, since then it's grown, but um, this is what I'm going to be adding um, my observations to, and anybody is welcome to look it up and add their observations to if they are around the Urban Ecology Center and see something cool. Um, uh, yeah, so that brings me to next week. Uh, I'm going to be having, there, I believe Amanda put a link in the chat, and um, I will be uh, leading a macro fungi observational foray uh, next week, Thursday, the 18th from four to six. And um, all of our findings that we have, uh, that we find on that walk will be added to um, the iNaturalist as well. And you can always visit uh, the iNaturalist and just like poke through what people are seeing. And, and it's just fun to look at um, the different observations that people have um, and the discussions that they're having and attempting to identify. I think like everybody knows everything about birds and already, you know, so it's like there, it, there's not a whole lot of debate, but since macrofungi are so under, understudied, there's still a lot of very, um, there's still a lot of, uh, um, I guess we need to all agree that this mushroom is that mushroom, you know, and that sometimes it can be complicated. So it's, it's fun. Um, and it's public, so you're welcome to join it. Um, so yeah, I can take any questions um, now, if anyone has any. That's all I got. 